A new book is out that we'd like to tell you about. It's a novel called Chariot on the Mountain, based on true events that occurred in the antebellum South. The riveting novel vividly recreates a treacherous journey towards freedom by a slave, her children, and the woman who owned them, and the improbable court case in which that slave brought a lawsuit against a white man. And joining us now is the author of Chariot on the Mountain, who some of you may be familiar with, Emmy and Peabody award-winning journalist, attorney, and TV anchor, Jack Ford. Jack, welcome to Metro Focus. <laughs> it's delight <laughs> to be here. You and I usually get to spend time, time outside of the studio. Rarely are we both in the studio I know. Here together. I know. I, I should say, I want to share with the audience that I was reading the book over the weekend. And before I was finished, I felt compelled to send you an email telling yeah, you how that much was I very loved kind it. Of you. And the more I read, the more I loved it. And I want to tell the audience, and I'm not saying this because you're a friend and a colleague, because as you know and everybody here knows, I only talk to authors whose books I like. Mm -hmm. So if you're here, it's because I like it. I appreciate it. Um, Thank you. So let's start uh, with a story. Can you give us a, a summary of the story uh, of the novel? It's, as you mentioned, it's this fascinating story, true story. You know, I've, I've, it's become historical fiction because I had to add elements. I had to create answers for the questions about why things happen, create conversations. But the, the genesis of it is um, my wife and I are staying at a little inn in a town in Virginia called Washington, Virginia, named after George Washington, who laid it out in 1740-something, about four or five square miles. When he was a teenager. A teenager. Yeah. And I always visit courthouses when I travel. You know, I spent so much of my life in a courthouse as a trial lawyer chronicling cases. And there's this marvelous courthouse in Washington, Virginia, built in 1830. You know, red brick columns, uh, one room courthouse. I went in to visit it and I came outside and there was a plaque outside. And the plaque talked about a case that had taken place there in 1846 when Kitty, an African American slave, was seeking her freedom. And I thought, I, I know a lot about the, the cases, historical cases out there. You know, I've... I've, I've, I've uh, I teach a course. I, I teach a course for 12 years at, up at Yale on famous trials. Taught at NYU, taught at the University of Virginia. I'd never heard about this. <laughs> and, and it's sort of, it's what launched me on literally two years worth of, of doing research and then finally sitting down and writing to tell the story about a young woman, Kitty, a slave in her 20s. Nobody knows because they're not sure when the slaves were actually born. Her biological father is her master, mm. and we've heard so often of that happening. Yeah. Um, the master and the mistress sold off her mother afterwards, but they brought her into the house and apparently taught her to read and write, which was illegal in Virginia mm. back then. Uh, but you've always wondered, what would the mistress's relationship have been with her? Master dies. The, the will, which I got a copy of, is very sketchy. The mistress thinks that she has the right to Kitty and, and her three children, who she had had by a free black man who had died. But there's a bad guy in the story, as there often is. Mm -hmm. A nephew who's saying, no, 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 the will gives me the right. And by the way, I want to sell them all. I need the money. He was mm -hmm. kind of a ne'er-do-well. And this launches them yeah. on this, uh, you know, an escape. The mistress takes her and says, I'm not going to let that happen. And you have to say, why would yeah. she do that? escape along the Underground Railroad. They think they're safe in Pennsylvania and they're not. Slave catchers are after them. And, you know, ultimately, as you mentioned, this fascinating trial that takes yeah. place. Yeah, which is uh, like the apex of the, of the mm. story. But it's all, it's all riveting. It, it, mm. it, you talk about the research. I mean, you literally, I mean, you, not literally, you virtually put us yeah. in the middle of 1846 um, Virginia. Right? I mean, we, we, we can see the place, we can hear the different accents, we can, we can detect the mores of the people. I mean, that research must have been vast. Talk a little bit about that. It, it was extraordinary for a lot of reasons. One, you talk about the place. Well, the place still exists. Yeah. You know, the courthouse is still there. It's, it's still used as the county seat. The jail that she and her children lived in for months awaiting this trial is still there. So mm. you know, the physical structure, the town, most of it looks pretty much like it looked back yeah. in 1846. But it, the, the research was interesting. So I find this plaque, I go back inside, and I talk to the woman who's the court clerk, who was, who was lovely and was very helpful to me for, for years, literally. Mm. And I say to her, I'm curious, the plaque outside. And she says, oh, you mean Kitty? And I said, yeah. I said, can you tell me anything about it? She says, come into my office. Huh. And she brings out a folder that has the actual handwritten court records of the trial amazing. from 1846. Amazing. Now, what's interesting about it is transcripts are not like we have now. Yeah. You know, they don't have all the details. This yeah. is what they said. This is cross-examination. There was a list of some witnesses, and there was the complaint. 
but there was a handwritten note from the jurors. There was a handwritten um, document from the judge right. deciding the case. So that was all there. Uh, although the, the handwritten documents, you know, 1846, the weird thing where the Fs look like S's. Yeah, I know, right? I know. You're right? trying to read that, and it's, it's very flimsy, the paper, and fading. And, and it set me on my own sort of journey. They then sent me down the street to the Rappahannock County Historical Society. I guess they were, mm. they were wonderful for me. And they had some documents, and they sent me, and this was the treasure trove, they sent me to the Chester County, Pennsylvania Historical Society. I said, why would I go to Pennsylvania? And it turned out that there was a historian in the 1940s whose family had a connection to the story, and he devoted almost a decade of his life to doing research. He got letters from descendants here, wow. found old, old court records, found old newspaper articles. He passed away before he had a chance to write anything. I walked in there, and they were wonderful for me. And they That's amazing. Bring he a, was, in fact, your researcher. He was. Yeah. yeah. This and is I, providential. And I, say, and I thank this him. This has to yeah. be providential. I'm looking at this. Rap, they brought me out 13 boxes like this oh, of God. his research. You know, so it, it, took, it took literally months, years to go through all of this and, and then to sit down mm -hmm. and start writing it. But to discover that all of this was still there about a story that nobody had heard of yeah. before, as you said, was yeah. truly providential. Now, now I, I should emphasize that this is not a story about slaves and slave owners as an abstract concept, um, as categories, but it's the story, as, as you depicted, of real, you know, flesh and blood human beings in all their dimensions. Um, I, I wonder if you could tell us about the three women protagonists, their relationship, and to what degree do you see this story as a story of redemption? It, that, those are great questions. Um, the, the leads are three women who could not be more different. You have a slave in her 20s. You have the woman who was her, her mistress in her 50s or so. Mm -hmm. And the third woman in this, in the story, is the richest woman in the county. Uh, her name was Fanny Withers. Her father had left her and her sister at a plantation, dozens of slaves. Um, she was sort of like a Scarlett O'Hara character, but kind of advanced for her time. She had her own portfolio of real estate <laughs> holdings yeah, that she wow. had put together. And she was friendly. She was a friend. And I had to create why, because I didn't know, with, with, with Mary Maddox, who was the mistress. So what you have, as you mentioned, is this extraordinarily unlikely alliance of three so very different women. And they joined together to, to do what they thought was justice here. And you know, one of my thoughts in putting this together is, boy, do these themes resonate today. Mm. You know, to see three powerful women who are willing to step out of the, the, the parameters of their existence and to be something greater and create something greater than each of them individually mm -hmm. because they all sense for their own reason that, that this is what was the right thing to do, what justice required of them. Mm -hmm. So for me, finding the power in that story, the power of this alliance of three women and what they could do, um, that was one of the most compelling parts of the story. Yeah, yeah. You know, we all know about slavery and, and uh, you know, its impact on our history. But when you describe it as devastatingly as you do, the, the, the devastating impact on real flesh and blood human beings, the de dehumanization, and it's, and it's rationalization by uh, allegedly civilized human beings, you know, it makes one wonder, what are we rationalizing today? What kind of inhuman activity are we rationalizing and just assuming it's okay that generations hence will say, how did they do that? And I wonder if the parallels was part of your aim in this novel to emphasize the moral sensibilities. Yeah. They absolutely were. And you look at it, and once again, you see people who are, are otherwise rational, reasonable, and even likable people. Um, Fanny Withers, the character, the richest woman, owns dozens of slaves. You know, so why does she decide that she's going to place her social status in jeopardy by helping one who is seeking her freedom and I have her talking in the book. Again, I had to sort of create this, but based upon arguments you've seen in the past that were advanced in support of slavery, the notion that the Bible, yeah. that you look in the Bible and, and those who supported slavery would, would, would quote chapter and verse of the Bible. And if you look at it, it is, the, these words in the Bible are suggesting that slavery is, is, is you know, part, part of, of the, the human condition. Human condition. Yeah. And you look back throughout history, societies that did it. 
And you, you say to yourself, all right, here's people that you think you would like otherwise, and yet they are adherents. They, they are people who advocate for the notion of slavery. And it's dehumanizing not only to the slave, but to the slaveholders, the slaveholders. As, you, as you show. And you saw, you know, you see them have to struggle with this. Yeah. You know, Mary Maddox, who, who is the wife and the mistress, you know, that her, her kitty's mother was sold off after her husband right. sires her. Now, what are they thinking? What, what, what are they wrestling with that we yeah. talked about here? But as you said, it makes us, let's see, if we can look back to 1846 and contemplate this, what are people going to do when they look back to us yeah. and contemplate what thing, certain things that we could rationalize and justify in our own minds? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so let's go back to the trial, because that is the apex, the, uh, the climax of the story. Uh, you touched on it, but, but tell us, you know, how, how much of what you depict actually happened? The, the vast majority of what's shown in the trial actually happened. Now, the testimony itself I had to create because there was no transcript of the actual testimony. But I created it based upon what I knew these people had either said um, or in, in some ways what they probably would have said mm -hmm. given their roles in, in certain instances here. Mm -hmm. You know, what was the interesting and, and enjoyable creative part for me as a former trial lawyer, you know, yeah. I've tried more than 100 cases, everything from death penalty cases to antitrust cases. I had to say, okay, if I'm here, if I'm Kitty's lawyer, what would I say? Yeah. When I was the reading, court, I said, Jack is yeah. really slow and right in this say? part. And what would I say if I'm the lawyer for the bad guy, the, yeah. the nephew, yeah. who's sort yeah. of defending him? Because, yeah. you know, Kitty stands up and for the, one of the first times ever says, I want to prosecute him. Mm -hmm. For, for kidnap and, and assault and beating me. And Law said, you can't, you're, you're a slave. Yeah. You have no rights. Mm -hmm. You know, black people, even free black people, couldn't even testify in a courtroom, much less slaves. So, you know, you, you had to create, what would the arguments be? What would it look like? What would it sound like? I did some research into trials in Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia back in the 1840s, what the procedures were, because they're a little bit different. In mm -hmm. some cases, a lot different from what we have today. So, you know, for me as a writer who is a former trial lawyer, writing the trial was, was one of more, the more enjoyable parts yeah. here yeah, yeah, yeah. because I could just see it playing out in this courtroom that I had visited many times. Yeah, I don't want to give away the, uh, what happens there, uh, but what, do you think there was significance to this trial? Um, there, it's interesting that there was significance in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, we, one of the things I talk about when I teach my course about famous trials, they said we like to think that, that trials provide us with the, with the truth. What they actually provide us with is a truth, a mm -hmm. truth of that moment inside of that courtroom, according to the 12 jurors. Trials don't provide us with the truth. And we've seen in the past, you know, we've learned, look at the Rosenberg spy case. Yeah. You know, the truth in that courtroom was a jury said that um, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were guilty of, of spying or conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Well, we now know the truth is that Julius Rosenberg was, but Ethel Rosenberg was not a spy. She was guilty of being married to a spy, mm -hmm. and yet she was executed for all that. So the truth can change. Um, but what, when you, so when you look at what happened here in that courtroom, and there was, it's interesting, we have a copy of a, a newspaper article from one of the Richmond newspapers reporting on it, talking about this unusual trial and how complicated it, it was. But it didn't become anything that changed laws. As significant as it was for the participants here as they struggled through this, you know, the, the trial had no bearing on what the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia were going to be down the road. As far as we know, didn't have any bearing on any other people, any other slaves who were looking for freedom. So it was a significant moment and a significant truth of that moment. Yeah. Now you have not quite let go of the characters yeah. even after you finished the book. Talk about that. You know, I've, I've heard other writers and I've talked to other writers, especially when they're writing something based upon you know, a true story. So I spent three years of my life with this, you know, researching it and not doing it full time, obviously, because you and I work full time. <laughs> but three years of my life doing research and, and sketching it out and talking with people about it and then doing the writing and then the editing that takes place. And in the end, I, it's interesting, I said this to my wife who reads every word that I write as we do it. And I said, when I finished writing, I felt a sense of loss, you know, that I was stepping away from something mm -hmm. that had, had, had been important to me for years. And a few weeks ago, I actually traveled out to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where she's buried. Mm -hmm. And she has a small headstone there, and it reads, all it reads is Catherine, because she took that name la later in life. You know, Catherine says the wife of Abraham Bryan died on, on a date. That's it. That's all that's on it. 
And I stood in front of the gravestone, and I actually, you, you felt an emotional connection to her, I think. And being able to see that, a, a literally and figuratively concrete representation yeah. of this person whose life I tried to, uh, tried to explain to some extent, yeah. you know, in hopes that people... Uh, it really moved uh, you. Did. The yeah, it did. But an interesting sort of asterisk on that, she's buried in a segregated cemetery. Lincoln Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, was the place where African Americans would be buried. There are some 30 African American Civil War veterans. They're not buried in the Gettysburg National Cemetery. They're buried in the Lincoln Cemetery. So this interesting irony to her life, you know, somebody who struggled for freedom and in, in, you know, for the rest of her life, this is where she's interred. Well, Jack, the dedication of your book reads, to the memory of Kitty Payne, with the hope that her story might inspire us all. I can assure you, you don't have to worry about that. It's impossible to read that book yeah. without being inspired and moved. The book is Chariot on the Mountain. It's a novel written by my good friend and colleague, Jack Ford. Jack, thank you so much for talking to me about this today. Raph, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.